it is impossible to know exactly what happened, but we can piece together some things in an intelligent and logical fashion. People don't realize the dark attention killers alone. San Antonio, Texas is about a two and a half hour drive from Mexico's border and is about an hour and a half drive from Austin, Texas. San Antonio has a rich history in the military dating back over 300 years as it is known as the home of the Alamo. Many residents of the city are employed by the military and it has become tradition for families to have multiple generations enlisted. It's also the location of many military bases, the largest being the Lackland Air Force Base. Lackland is where the U.S. Air Force conducts its basic training. In 1986, 29-year-old Kathleen Lipscomb had two young children and worked as a nurse at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, Texas. Kathleen was married for eight years to 33-year-old Master Sergeant William T. Lipscomb, known to friends as Bill. He worked for the U.S. Air Force at the Lachlan Air Force Base. Kathleen and Bill live close to the base. The couple had moved to San Antonio when Bill entered the Air Force as a trainee. Over a short period of time, Bill gained several promotions and before he was in his 30s, became the youngest person in Air Force history to become a Master Sergeant. As a drill instructor, Bill tried to appear intimidating to the trainees and enjoyed being in control. Kathleen was moving up in her career too. She was asked by one of the doctors at the hospital to join his department to conduct research. Kathleen gladly took the offer. With things going well at work for both Kathleen and Bill, the couple grew further apart. After eight years of marriage, the couple had decided to separate. Kathleen would have the children during the week and they would go with Bill on the weekends. Kathleen's mother said she was close with her family. She was a very caring person. Uh, she loved her family. She stayed in constant contact with us. On the night of Sunday, June 8th, 1986, Kathleen was supposed to pick up the children from Bill's, as she usually did, but when she didn't arrive, Bill decided to drive the children to Kathleen's apartment. When they got there, they found that she wasn't home and her car was gone. Bill left a note on the door that said, Kathleen, it's 645. The kids and I were here. Bill. Then he returned home with the children. On Monday morning, Kathleen had still not made contact with Bill about picking up the children. Kathleen's mother and sister were concerned that they had not heard from her since Saturday. One of her co-workers called me and told me that they were worried that she hadn't showed up for work. My stomach kind of you know, knotted up for a minute and then I thought, no, you know, Bill had the kids. Kathleen probably went out with some girlfriends or something and she'll, she'll be in. She's just late today. By Monday afternoon on June 9th, 1986, a man found a new body off the side of a deserted road outside of town. The man contacted authorities who arrived and, not long after arriving, discovered it was Kathleen. Police determined that she had been killed elsewhere then placed in the field off the road. Kathleen was identified by her own co-workers because they had been searching for her all morning and knew she was missing. The co-workers told police that Kathleen was in the middle of a divorce from her husband, Bill. Near Kathleen's body lay her clothing. They had been rolled up instead of thrown about or in a pile or even folded. This indicated something interesting about the person who left them, according to one of the investigators at the scene. 
That's definitely military. I mean, just without a doubt, that's the only people that I have ever seen roll their clothes in, the, in that fashion, is, is a military type person. There were no fresh tire tracks or footmarks leading from the road to where she was found. An autopsy was conducted on Kathleen, which indicated the cause of death was strangulation. The coroner suggested that she had been intimate with someone in the last 24 hours before her death as male DNA was found. Because of the forensic technology and beliefs stemming from the lack of technology in education, the belief was that because Bill had a vasectomy, he was ruled out as a possible source of the DNA. Kathleen's body appeared to have been washed after her death. In order to determine the time of death, the medical examiner determined her last meal was Chinese food. The food they found was able to be identified because it was undigested, meaning she had eaten shortly before her death. She had numerous ant bites on her legs. This indicated she was placed there in the early morning hours and sat there for a long period of time before being discovered in the afternoon, as ant activity usually occurs during the daylight hours. A week after Kathleen's death, her car was found in the parking lot of a Luby's restaurant not far from her apartment. No foreign fingerprints were found inside or around the car. In the months leading up to Kathleen and Bill's separation, Kathleen's career was becoming too much for Bill to handle. He belittled her work and treated her with resentment and jealousy. Kathleen began spending more time at work away from home in order to avoid spending time with Bill. The separation between Kathleen and Bill had not been going smoothly. Bill wanted full custody of the children, and Kathleen wasn't going to agree to that. Immediately, police asked Bill to come to the police station for questioning. They said Bill was shocked to hear that Kathleen was dead and seemed genuinely surprised. Bill had even helped search for Kathleen Monday morning. They searched his body for any marks that could be considered defensive wounds and under his fingernails for any foreign skin cells. Nothing was found. Bill's alibi was that he had been with the children all weekend, an alibi which the children confirmed. Friends of Kathleen's told investigators that Kathleen had been seeing a married doctor who she worked with at the hospital named David Pearl. Kathleen and David spent a lot of time together working on research projects and soon became romantically involved. David treated Kathleen much nicer than Bill, which made her fall for him so easily. Kathleen had been seeing David before she and Bill had separated. David told Kathleen that he was living in his own apartment while he and his wife were going through a divorce. He invited Kathleen to his apartment one night, and the two started their affair. What Kathleen didn't know was that, as soon as she left that night, David left the apartment right after her to return home to his wife, who he was still very much married to. Kathleen believed the two would be together, since he was in the middle of a divorce from his wife. But the doctor had no intentions of leaving his wife, as he had promised many women he would before. David would tell women he was separated from his wife when he wasn't. When police were able to get David to come to the police station for questioning, he didn't arrive alone. His wife went with him. He told police he was with Kathleen during the weekend of Saturday, June 7th, 1986, but he said he had nothing to do with her death. As they pressured him further for questions, David asked to speak with his lawyer. Other than the doctor, police found another possible suspect, a nurse who worked with Kathleen at the hospital, who also lived at the same apartment complex as her. His name was Vincent. He was absent from work the day Kathleen's body was found. Investigators found out that Vincent had left town and didn't pick up his paycheck or ask for it to be sent to his new address. Police were finally able to get in touch with Vincent. He said he had returned to his hometown of Galveston, Texas, and was working there as a nurse at the local hospital. He said he had left town so quickly because he had a fight with his boyfriend and didn't want anything to do with San Antonio. By 1988, two years after her death, the investigation had stalled as little evidence was found at the scene to connect any of the suspects to the crime. Kathleen's family hired a private investigator to take a closer look into her murder. The PI found out that when Kathleen told Bill she had filed for divorce in May of 1986, Bill was surprisingly fine with that. They also found that after Kathleen had served Bill with divorce papers, Bill increased Kathleen's life insurance policy to $315,000.
This was a definite red flag to Kathleen's family. Kathleen's death came just days before the divorce would have been finalized. Kathleen's family said she had tried to leave Bill in 1985, but he left the state with the children so she had no choice but to stay with him. The PI took a look at the items in Kathleen's apartment. He found one of her day planners for the year 1986. One of the entries for Saturday, March 22nd, said, Baseball tournament. Got home at 10.30. Shannon Gilbert there. The PI had not heard that name mentioned in the investigation before. When he looked into Shannon Gilbert, he found that she worked at the Lackland Air Force Base with Bill. Rumor around the base was that the two were romantically involved. The police didn't question Bill about a girlfriend, so they must have been unaware that Bill could have been seeing someone around the time of Kathleen's death. The PI called the Lackland Air Force Base and asked to speak to Shannon. He told her he was hired by Kathleen's family to look into her death. The PI had a peculiar conversation with Shannon. She said, is this about Bill Lipscomb? We said, yes, ma'am, it is. And she says, I will need an attorney. And at that point, I knew I had something. Her response to the call from the PI was interesting because it's something people say to police officers when they are being questioned. It seems like an odd thing to say to someone without the authority to arrest you if you had no knowledge of a crime. The PI asked to meet with her at the police station and she agreed. It turned out Kathleen wasn't the only one stepping out of their marriage. Bill had found himself some attention from a young recruit at the base named Shannon Gilbert. Bill was her drill instructor and the two were not permitted to have a relationship as Bill was her superior, so the two kept their relationship quiet for as long as they could. Their relationship turned romantic one day when Shannon just happened to be driving near Bill's home and saw him out for a walk. Bill told her that he and Kathleen had a fight. She invited Bill to her house and their relationship continued on from there. At one point, Kathleen and David traveled to a conference for work and took advantage of their time together away from home. Kathleen was convinced at this point that they were going to be together. Meanwhile, Bill was at home imagining his wife in the arms of a successful doctor. He did some snooping around the house, and in Kathleen's dresser, he found a pack of birth control pills. Since Bill had a vasectomy after the children were born, that confirmed to Bill that Kathleen was having an affair with someone else. Upon returning from the trip, Kathleen attended one of Bill's baseball games and found he had a cheerleader, Shannon. Kathleen knew it was time to leave Bill, and was hoping to end up with Dr. David, who she still believed was in the middle of a divorce. In May 1986, Kathleen officially filed for divorce from Bill. When she told David they could be together, he said he didn't expect her to really go through with a divorce from Bill. David knew his wife would not have agreed to the idea of a divorce. She liked the lifestyle that came with being the wife of a prominent doctor. Of course, he probably didn't express these feelings to Kathleen and continued the affair as he admitted to being with her on Saturday, June 7, 1986, the last day she was alive. A closer examination in the lab of the clothing found at the scene indicated they were indeed Kathleen's clothing, and they found four red hairs which did not belong to Kathleen as she was blonde. The hairs had been dyed red and none of the hairs had roots attached, which means they weren't pulled directly from the scalp. The hairs were not matched to Bill or David. DNA was still years away and would be harder to test without the roots attached. One of Kathleen's neighbors told the PI that on the Monday morning she went missing, they saw a lady with red hair walk up to Kathleen's door, then a few minutes later walk away. This turned out to be a co-worker of Kathleen's who went to check on her when she didn't show up for work. Another entry in the day planner covered the entire month of January. It read, Numerous calls and nights out passing information around concerning WAPS testing. Has all questions for the test. WAPS stands for Weighted Airman Promotion Test. It's a test taken by military members for promotion. This entry seemed to be Kathleen making note of Bill's actions, indicating he had possibly cheated on his promotion tests. After all, Bill had been promoted faster than any other master sergeant in Air Force history. Kathleen's sister indicated Bill knew Kathleen could ruin his career by revealing he had cheated on the tests. She knew it, and he knew that 
it would bust him. So that's that's the button she used. I mean, she pushed it, and he told her, you know, you, you can't do this because if you do, you're going to end up on a cold slab. Shannon arrived at the police station dressed in her Air Force uniform with a lawyer and asked for full immunity in the event the information she had could incriminate her. Police agreed, and Shannon began by telling them she had nothing to do with Kathleen's death. She said she knew Bill was a cheater and a liar because he had cheated his way through the ranks to Master Sergeant. Apparently, Bill had failed the Master Sergeant's test the first time he took it and didn't want to fail it again. Through a system of paid informants, Bill collected the test questions and answers in advance to taking the tests. According to Shannon, Bill was helping other people cheat too. The cheating spanned all over the country and affected multiple Air Force bases. Bill was known as the head of the cheating ring and Kathleen knew about it. Shannon said this gave Kathleen the leverage she needed in order to gain full custody of the children. Bill told Shannon, Kathleen has everything on me. She can do whatever she wants right now. And Bill wasn't having it. All Bill could think about was how he was in jeopardy of losing his career. How he could be charged with a crime in military court, dishonorably discharged, lose his pay and benefits, and at the very least be demoted to the lowest level and have to start his career over. Bill wouldn't be the only one going down for the cheating ring, though. The other people involved would also be punished. When asked by police who she thought killed Kathleen, Shannon said Bill had told her that he had planned to kill Kathleen then pointed them in the direction of Bill's friend Clint, who she said may be able to help them fill in more of the blanks. Once the cheating allegations surfaced in December 1988, the Air Force's Office of Special Investigations got involved in the case. The special investigator involved in the case explains how the Air Force's involvement in the cheating case can help police solve the murder case. If you have a uh, related peripheral crime, which in its own respect I guess was serious enough but uh, certainly doesn't compare to a murder case, that gives you a, a venue of access that makes it easier to get closer to your subject. The special investigator reviewed the crime scene photos and noticed something telling about the position of Kathleen's body. The positioning of the body and the context of how it was found suggested to me that the scene had been staged in order to convey an impression that this was a rape murder. And this is, and this is where the victim wound up. And it didn't have a ring of authenticity to it. The special investigator noticed that it appeared Kathleen's body was stored in a cramped area following her death and before being placed in the field because her legs were crossed, as if sitting on the floor when she was found. This indicated rigor mortis had begun during the time she was stored and before being placed in the field. The special investigator suggested Kathleen was killed shortly after dinner in the evening, then placed in a container before being transported to the field close to dawn. The special investigator also suggested that someone other than the killer had placed Kathleen's body in the field. Usually, if the person transporting the body knows the victim, there is an attempt to cover the body or the victim's face as they transport and place the body where it's found. Kathleen's body was not covered. The special investigator suggested the crime scene had clues to indicate the murder was committed and covered up by more than one person, and how this can be beneficial evidence for investigators. That became extremely important because if you have multiple players in a crime, you have better opportunities for identifying, uh, for, first of all, for identifying who they are, and then for playing one off against the other. Kathleen's sister was surprised by what the special investigator suggested after reviewing the evidence. Within 30, 45 minutes of reviewing the evidence, he told us that Bill did it. Bill was actually the murderer, where we had all at that point thought he just paid someone to do it. P.I. requested the male DNA found on Kathleen be tested. After sitting in the lab for only two years, the samples were no longer viable and could not be tested. Two years after Kathleen's murder, when she was nine years old, Kathleen's daughter told her grandmother a different story about the weekend her mother went missing. She said to me, Grandma, who do you think killed my mother or my mama? And I said, I don't know, who do you think killed your mama? And she told me, my daddy did because he wasn't where he said he was that night. Kathleen's children later told investigators that on the weekend their mother went missing, 
They spent Saturday with Bill's friend Clint, who took them out to eat at McDonald's. They said they woke up that night and their father wasn't home and his car was gone. Kathleen's daughter said she didn't say anything sooner because her father Bill had threatened to spank her very hard if she told anyone their secret. The way the clothing were rolled up at the scene indicated to police that the person who left Kathleen in the field came from a military background. The only other person who was in the military and around Bill that weekend was his friend who took the children out to eat, Staff Sergeant Clint Nicholas Richards. Clint was Bill's partner in the cheating ring. Police went to Clint and told him they knew he was involved in Kathleen's death and told him how and why he did it to scare him into confessing, and it worked. Clint said, You've got this all wrong. I can clear this up. Bill was the one who actually had taken Kathleen's life. He called me up the weekend that Kathleen died. He said he had killed Kathleen and needed help disposing of her body. A few months after Kathleen's death, Clint was dishonorably discharged from the Air Force. When police questioned him again about Kathleen's death, Clint had some new information. He said the guilt had been weighing heavily on him. He told police he was the one who transported and left Kathleen in the field. He said that Bill had killed Kathleen. He said Kathleen had been stored in a cedar chest, which he said he still had despite being told by Bill to destroy it. Inside the chest, investigators found a tiny spot which was tested and confirmed to be Kathleen's blood. On July 7, 1989, police had Clint meet with Bill while wearing a hidden microphone, but Bill didn't say anything to Clint to incriminate himself, although he was caught on tape trying to pay Clint to leave the area. The special investigator decided to turn up the heat on Bill to see what he would do under pressure. This was an event that was a consequence of a marriage that went bad. There was a tremendous amount of anger. There was a tremendous amount of hostility. I wanted to see if I could feel that hostility so I could understand it and understand his reaction to it and then develop an investigative methodology that would counter that and deal with his own psychology. I wanted him to hear footsteps that weren't there. I wanted him to have that feeling in the pit of the stomach every time the phone rang. I wanted him to worry about whether today was going to be the day that he heard the knock on the door. I wanted to raise his level of anxiety. With two cooperating witnesses, Investigators told Bill that his friends were now telling them a different story about the weekend of Kathleen's death. The special investigator from the Air Force sat down for an interview with Bill. Of all the ways this had to end, I don't understand why it had to end the way it did. Why did you kill her? And he said, I don't know why I killed her. But then he immediately caught himself and leaned forward and crossed his arms and said, I did not kill my wife. But we had him. Soon after Kathleen's death, Bill requested a humanitarian transfer to Langley Air Force Base, Virginia, so he could be near his parents who could help him care for the children. On July 10, 1989, police arrested Bill for Kathleen's murder. At the time, Bill was living with his second wife, Beverly, her two children, and his two children, paying bills with Kathleen's $290,000 life insurance policy. One of the neighbors said to reporters about Bill, he seemed very nice, except he looked like he had a temper sometimes. I saw him pick up his dog by the ears and kick him across the yard. But other than that, he seemed like a nice guy. Bill was charged with murder and his trial was held in military court. If found guilty, Bill could receive the death penalty. The trial was set to begin June 20th, 1990. Although little physical evidence was found linking Bill to her death, Prosecutors hoped Clint and Shannon would be sufficient evidence. Prosecutors believed Kathleen threatened to expose Bill's cheating on his military exams if he tried to get full custody of the children. They suggested that on Saturday, after the children left with Clint, Bill called Kathleen and asked her to come to his house to pick up some family photos that he said he wanted her to have. He said Kathleen proceeded to cut him out of the photos in front of him. Bill was convinced that Kathleen was going to be with Dr. David and that he would be raising Bill and Kathleen's children. Bill wasn't having any of that. Bill picked up some cables and wrapped it around Kathleen's neck until she was no longer breathing. At some point, he sexually assaulted her. He then placed her in the chest until that night, at which point Clint transported Kathleen to the field. 
If Kathleen wasn't declared dead and instead a missing person, Bill would not be able to collect on Kathleen's life insurance money. The red hairs found at the scene were believed to be planted. Before the trial could begin, Bill's lawyer approached the prosecution looking for a deal. They wanted to avoid the death penalty, and in order to do so, Bill had to plead guilty and confess to the crime. On August 20th, 1990, Bill pled guilty to Kathleen's murder to avoid the death penalty. He told prosecutors how he killed Kathleen. On the afternoon of June 8, 1989, Bill said the conversation between the two turned violent. He admitted to stripping her of her clothes, raping her, then strangling her with a cable cord, blaming his rage on Kathleen's affair. He confirmed what investigators already suspected. He placed her in the chest, waited for the children to return to put them to bed, then had Clint return to pick up and dispose of both Kathleen and the chest. Bill said that Kathleen had also threatened to tell his superiors about the cheating ring. Bill had accumulated the questions from the test by paying others who had taken the test to tell him the questions. Bill also pled guilty to obstructing justice for trying to offer Clint money to leave the area. Clint and Shannon were both given immunity for their testimony. In return for his cooperation, Clint avoided any criminal charges involving Kathleen's death. Shannon Gilbert was also not charged, but she did change her name and enter the Federal Witness Protection Program, maybe out of fear of Bill. Kathleen's love interest, Dr. David, and his wife were cleared of any involvement in her death. Bill was sentenced to 60 years or life in prison, but has been eligible for parole since 1998. He was dishonorably discharged and had to forfeit all of his future pay. Bill was granted 218 days served for his time held during trial, which he spent most of that time in solitary confinement. By pleading guilty, Bill was not eligible to appeal his sentence. Bill was serving his sentence at the United States Disciplinary Barracks in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. It seems he has since been transferred to and is currently incarcerated at the Butner Federal Medical Center located in Butner, North Carolina. His current release date is set for December 23, 2025, although this would put his time served to only 35 years. Kathleen is buried in Red Shoot, Louisiana. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story, and I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. Here's what's making news. Murder for hire. 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 Back in January, 71-year-old Alan J. Abrahamson was found dead in a field near his Palm Beach Gardens home. Cops say he died of a gunshot wound to his chest, but no weapon was found with his body. Police put out calls to help them solve the crime, even offering a reward in the case. But now they're saying Abrahamson himself was the culprit all along. Investigators combed through his computer and phones to look for leads. But instead of finding suspects, they found receipts and emails for weather balloons, helium tanks, and rubber bands. They also say his search history turned up questions about whether life insurance companies pay out policies in the event of a suicide. Cops say Abrahamson had run through his retirement savings and staged a homicide so his family would get his life insurance money. Police say they still have not found the gun, which could have been carried more than 100,000 feet in the air by the balloon. Well, that's going to do it for all of us here. Thanks for listening and joining us for another episode. Really appreciate every listener. The more aware we are, the better we can protect ourselves. If you'd like to discuss the case further, comment below. You can also find us on Instagram and Twitter at Stage Crime Scenes Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe for the latest episodes.